He is a renowned facial plastic surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. His foundation for special surgery is dedicated to providing high quality, complex surgical care to patients across Africa. Meet the man who is making a difference one surgery at a time, Dr. Kofi Owusu Wahini. Dr. Kofi Bahini, it's so good to see you. Same here. Same Last here. time I saw you was during the gala. Correct. You had the annual gala. Correct. For the foundation for Correct. special surgeries. Yeah. And I was so honored to be the MC. Yes, uh, thank uh, you very much for doing <laughs> such a wonderful job. Thank you. It was a fabulous, fabulous uh, event. And uh, speaking about the event, the reason was uh, that uh, you were presenting and also raising funds yes. uh, for. Uh, one of your very important projects. You know, for the past um, 14 years, um, on my own time, with m my own resources, I gather friends and colleagues and people I've trained to go and join me around the world, and particularly in Africa, mm -hmm. to do missionary work and provide surgical care. Yes. And um, last December was the very first time that we asked the general population to join hands with us to do and support this um, cost. So it, it was a good event and yes. uh, a happy validation for all the work we've been doing. And you've been doing yeah. such great work. I mean, I've known you for, for many years now, yeah. full disclosure. And uh, one of the things that I really admire uh, about you is uh, the impact that you have. Yes, you are a surgeon, uh, but uh, it goes beyond just being a surgeon. You have the heart for what you do. Uh, talk to us about, first of all, why you became a surgeon. You know, <laughs> I've said this story many, many times that I'm the last person you would ever think growing up who would be a surgeon because amongst my siblings, and I have like eight siblings, mm -hmm. I didn't like the sight of blood. I just <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't stand blood. So it's <laughs> strange that I ended up becoming a surgeon. But it's a series of events. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one that led me to first pursue medicine in the first place. But once I got into medicine, you know, there are a few things that you experience that really just turn it on for you. Yes. And, and to me, it was seeing surgeons take someone who is shot in the face, putting them back together within hours, mm -hmm. taking someone who can't smile, putting them back and within um, weeks they smile. It's just sort of fixing things. Yes. And yes. growing up, I like to fix things, except that those things never bled. <laughs> I read your book, uh, which is uh, However Far the Stream Goes. Uh, talk to us about that. And in the book, actually, you talk about the story of your friend who was injured. The book, However Far a Stream Flows, is a part of a proverb, an African proverb. And the full proverb goes and says, however far a stream flows, it never forgets its source. Yes. And to me, when I was leaving Ghana as a child um, to go to school in Moscow, my dad called me and said he wanted to tell me a story that his mother told him when he was leaving the village. Mm -hmm. And his mother said, I want you to see where your mother sleeps. So when you go into the big town and you become this big deal person, <laughs> not to forget where you started from. Yes, and so yes. that story has followed me and it's the motivation for the title of the, the book. But um, as the story goes, when I was in high school, one of my classmates against school rules went on a jolly ride on a motorbike and injured himself to the point of closely losing his life. Wow. And um, we had to carry him as 16, 17 year olds to the nearest emergency room. Yes. And he was bleeding and we were holding his clothes trying to stop the bleed and there was an immediate care. And um, that's one of the first things that told me this doesn't look right and I had to do something about it. And it's some of the things that sow the seed of trying to be a doctor and a surgeon. Okay. And the second thing was that I held on to his white t-shirt soaked with blood. Even after he, we left the hospital, I held on to it. Mm -hmm. Eventually threw it into the bushes. And I realized, actually, I could handle blood. <laughs> so that was the In beginning. The yes. <laughs> yeah. You, okay, so after this experience, you, you thought maybe you could become a doctor. But uh, did you think about surgery in terms of the, the kind of impact you wanted to do? At that time I just wanted to be a doctor, uh -huh. right? And then um, I took some detours. 
Yes, you did. I took some detours. <laughs> went went to Russia. I went to Russia and I was put in a veterinary medicine class, <laughs> not human medicine, oh, which wow. I loved. Mm -hmm. You know, and the first surgery I did was actually on a horse. And it's an amazing specimen to work on. Wow. Um, but eventually I knew my heart was in human medicine. And when I switched and came to the U.S. and went to undergraduate and did science and went to master's and eventually went into medical school, um, I was immediately attracted to surgery because, you know, you have a problem, you see the problem, you design a plan and you fix it, right? Yes, it sounds so easy. Uh, it sounds so easy. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> One of the, uh, the, the aspects of your story that, are, that really fascinates me is the fact that it seems like it, there was every time in your life there was a, a divine intervention, if you will, yes. um, to make you move toward your next step. I've always said that I've, I've been the beneficiary of many Samaritans, mm. people who at vital points in my life pushed me on to the next um, level. Yes. And one of them was in college. Um, so I came to the U.S. with a sense that I wanted to do medicine, but once I got here, I realized I don't have family, I don't have resources, medical school is very long, there's just no way I can do it, so I should do something else. Yes. I had a friend who was a mechanic in, in Texas. He wanted to be a veterinary medicine doctor. He actually went to veterinary school for a year and quit because he didn't have the resources and then ended up opening a mechanic shop. And so I worked with him, I lived with him for months and I said, teach me how to work on cars. So you know how to work? Do I worked on cars. So you can fix my car for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked on cars and uh, we had a, a conversation one time mm -hmm. and it was, it stuck with me. Okay. Um, I told him, you know, I, I just don't have means of supporting ed education in medicine. Yeah. So I'm going to find something else. Computer science was popular. Maybe I'll do, just do something. He looked at me and said, you know, unless you plan on being dead before 20 years, wow. 20 years is going to come and go, mm -hmm. it better find you doing the thing that you really want to do. So regardless of how long it takes, just, just start. And it stuck with me. And, and I'm saying 20 years later, I had the same conversation with him and he didn't remember telling me that. Really? So do, small conversations that we yes, have with people yes, can have yes. a big impact either bringing them down or pushing them up. So he was one of them. So fast forward, I find myself in college. Um, I did chemistry and my chemistry teacher knew that I had gotten into medicine. I got into medical school and um, I was looking for the money and couldn't find the money. I have financial aid forms and somebody who is a citizen or a re resident has to co-sign and I couldn't find anyone. And then he just offered to do it. And um, out of nowhere. Your professor. Yes. Yeah, so today you not. are one of the very well-known surgeons at, at Johns Hopkins. Thank you. And um, we we hear about your work, and that's one of the that's how I discovered you actually yeah. doing research. Now there are young men and women uh, that will watch your story and say, "He did it. How can I make this happen for myself?" Yeah. What do you have to tell them? You know, I had a conversation with someone yesterday and said, if I was given a blank sheet of paper and I'm told, write out your life the way you want it to be, maybe 20, 30 years, and pick the best thing, I could not have written it the way it is right now. So what I tell people is that just decide that this is what I want to achieve and see what that you have in your hands now. Forget about looking at what it's going to be five, ten years from now. And just do the best with what you have now. And you will find out that as you do, doors open, some doors close. Yes. People come your way, they, they push you up. Yes. And um, the story and the script may be much better than you think. Yes, that's interesting. Now, there's also something that you are involved in, which is uh, medical missions. Yes. Uh, talk to us about that. So, um, you know, it's a strange thing for me to live in Maryland, work at one of the best hospitals in the country, if not the world. And then I come here and I take care of people from all walks of, walks of life. I have people from Saudi Arabia, from Asia, from Baltimore, California, and they will come to seek my expertise and I will take care of them. Some life-changing, some life-saving. Then I'll take a plane and then I'll fly to Ghana or Rwanda. And it's just like a 11 hour flight. 
And the same problem that I took care of with two hour surgery is going to take away somebody's life or their livelihood or their family. And that dichotomy doesn't sit well with me. And so I remember where I came from. So I can give back. I and it's, far. Yes. And that's the title of the book. Yes. yes. So I have the book, However Far the Stream Flows, The Making of the Men Who Rebuilds Faces. And the cover is so beautiful. Now you have your son on the cover of the book. Yes, yes. I mean, why did you think of putting him there? He's the future. Yes. I want them to remember where they came from. Mm -hmm. I want them to remember what, what, where I started from. This is something that is hopefully will stay with them uh, for a long time, even yes. when I'm not here. Um, the funny I issue about the uh, story about the picture on the back is I've got twin boys. I was going to ask you, yes. how do the siblings feel? <laughs> yes, I, I, I have twin boys, so of course, who do you choose, exactly. right? They both had pictures taken, and so eventually I told them, you know, it's the body of one and the head of the other. <laughs> and those twins had, were clued in that that was not the case. Oh, so okay. after the book came out, I told them, I confessed, actually, it's the older of the twins. And the younger one said, Dad, don't worry, I will be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> No, so so, so they, they, had, they had it sorted <laughs> that's out. That's brilliant. What would you like people to take away when they read the book? Um, see, that when you see somebody who has achieved something, mm -hmm. there's always a story behind. And it's worth really knowing the entire story because it may help you set your mind, reinforce the path that you've chosen, yeah. maybe redirect you a little bit mm -hmm. because we all have stories to say. I don't think my story is so unique. As immigrants um, and people in the diaspora, we have unique stories. The challenges that we have to go through, I've been able to pen, it, pen them together, um, but it may bring memories back to others to say, you know, I'm not alone in this challenge. It may really be a motivation for them to achieve what they want to achieve. The surgeries that you conduct are very, very complex. I work in the head and neck area, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a very delicate area because, number one, our faces are who we are. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. You change somebody's face, you've actually changed their identity. In fact, when there are diseases that will affect the face and people go into depression, they don't communicate, they don't express themselves, they um, pull themselves away from society. Yeah. So I have to be very careful how I plan surgeries around the face. Um, the surgeries I do may be trying to treat ch children who were born with deformities and you're trying to really make them as normal as possible. Sometimes it's taking a cancer out, and so you're not just changing the way people look, you're trying to save lives. Wow. And sometimes it's a quality of life. Somebody whose face is paralyzed, like they had a stroke. They can talk, they can smile, and you're trying to put a smile back together. Mm -hmm. And so you, you keep doing these surgeries, and, but then they're never a routine. You know, when I have a patient, they are asleep, I do a lot. But I remember the families, who they were before the patient went to sleep, mm -hmm. how I'm going to take care of them a year after surgery, and that sort of influences what you do. Um, so it's really a taking care of a life, a face, a person, and a family. And so what makes someone a good surgeon? I think some people are naturally gifted with using their hands. Mm -hmm. Some people have to really work at it. And I actually think those who really work at it may become much better than those who think they are naturally gifted. There are some things that help, depending on the field that you are in. Mm -hmm. I think if you are somebody who can see things and imagine things in three dimensions, um, I tell my friends when I was young, I was making cars out of contents and paper boxes and being creative and try putting things together. So it's not surprising that I did plastic surgery okay. and trying to really think things in three dimensions. If you're going to take a tumor out in the head, there are blood vessels, there are muscles, there are nerves, things that if you injure, you can, you can kill somebody. So you have to kind of imagine how you can get there without really disrupting normal things. So Dr. Bohini, uh, it's time for the VIP game. Okay. And uh, we're going to go to the bench. But before we do that though, there's that one story you told me before, the story of the boy that was considered the village fool. Uh, oh yes. Oh, and yes. a small uh, gesture made a big difference in yes. his life. So this, this is a story about a young boy, maybe in his teens. 
in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, he couldn't really speak very well. And everybody thought, mm, this is a fool. And on a mission trip, as we're trying to evaluate who was going to get surgery, this boy was really getting his voice out, trying to attract attention, help me, help me. And everybody tell me, ignore that boy, he's just the village fool. And um, just by looking under the tongue, there is something we call tongue tie, where a tissue that is supposed to be loose to allow your tongue to move was very tight and didn't allow the tongue to move. And a simple snip, that takes like two, three minutes, and the boy is uh, speaking. So it's just em emblematic of how simple things can change people's life yeah, when they write solution. The solution is just minutes away. Yes, yeah. it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I love that yeah. story because yeah. it's it's really to think that all his life he lived in a, in this belief that he wasn't good enough. Correct. And then just three Correct. minutes Correct. made a difference. That was it. That's unbelievable. Yep. All right, time for the VIP game, Dr. Okay. Wahini. <laughs> No rules, but it's simple. You just pick up the card and there's a statement and you complete the sentence. Okay. And now you get a choice to ask me the same question or any question you like. So. Okay, well, let's start with the central one. How about okay. that? If I was not a surgeon, I may have become well, perhaps an architect. An architect? Yeah, perhaps. I like building stuff. Okay. So I, can, I could see designing structures that right. people are going to really make an impact in the world oh. in. So I would say an architect. Okay, maybe in your next life. <laughs> maybe my next life. I would ask you the same question if you were not doing what you're doing now. What would I become? Uh, maybe a nun. <laughs> a nun? Yes, I know. Interesting. Yeah, just yeah. living a simple life of service. Service. Wonderful, yes. wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Next card. Okay, let's try this one. I love my life because it has a purpose. Mm. Um, it has a purpose and it's, it's um, a fulfilled life. I am surrounded by people who I love and who love me. Um, I could not have chosen any better parents. Um, people bring meaning into my life and hopefully I have a abandoned life going forward. Oh, and I can yeah. enjoy it more. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 That's great. Given all the people that you are impacted in yes. any way. Well, uh, my question to you is, um, so far uh, as VIP has been running, uh, what are some of the um, joys that is brought to you so far? For me, it's uh, the ability of telling stories such as yours. Uh, people that are uh, living this life, making an impact. And so when I get to tell stories like that and, and show how we can all make a difference, it doesn't have to be uh, tremendous to make an impact. And so that's really one of the reasons why we do that. And we want to create a platform for solidarity, uh, sharing some of the stories that uh, we can maybe support yeah. or we can uh, take examples from and try to do the same or better. So okay. it's all about bringing out our humanity. Excellent. So we have three more. Let's try this one. My favorite vacation destination is, um, that's difficult. Maybe <laughs> give me a choice, a, a few. Um, one is definitely Ghana, going back home, because mm -hmm. there's nothing better than home. Absolutely. And I'm seeing I my agree. parents, it's very fulfilling. <laughs> and the second place is a place in Germany, I'll call Regensburg, Germany. Regensburg is a very old town that is really preserved. Um, wasn't touched by the uh, World War okay. and it's just antique in its look. I like going there because I have a very good friend there who is actually partnering with me. We went to training together mm -hmm. and made a promise to each other we're going to do mission work uh, together and okay. he went back to Germany but we meet there almost two three times a year and then we go to Rwanda and other places and we are working together on the foundation and the hospital we are trying to build okay. so it's another special place for me oh wow yeah. that's fantastic how about you well for me home first just yes. as as you said is uh, seeing family parents and everything there's nothing like home yeah and then uh, i must say i mean i've been to a few places but i love marrakesh ah yeah i love marrakesh i love the climate i love uh, just uh, the culture because the city has, has kept something very cultural you know in yeah. the architecture and everything we Wonderful. have two, cars two left. more these two ones we'll take yes. this one okay <laughs> 
Ooh, my favorite dessert is, oh, th there's no question about it, ice cream with chocolate on it. Oh, my God. You know, Ghana, Ghana produces cocoa. I got to support it. So anything <laughs> with chocolate in it, that's it. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Ice cream always works, yeah, right? Yeah, it always works. <laughs> and I'll ask you the same question. Well, I do love ice cream, but I have to tell you this story. A friend of mine made me eat ice cream with avocado. That's something I'm still trying to process. Oh, oh it was goodness. the weirdest combination. <laughs> Last question, um, what is your favorite men's accessories in terms of clothing? A tie. Hey, Yes, a tie. Okay. It always balances things out. Mine is shoes. Oh, um, <laughs> I could have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Mahini, thank you so much, and it was wonderful. Uh, before we wrap very quickly, just tell us again one more thing about uh, your foundation and uh, what's coming up. Yeah, so the foundation for special surgery is the vehicle that we are using to do all this work. Mm -hmm. And um, the primary goal for this um, foundation is actually to build capacity. And one of our main projects that we are working on is actually building a specialty hospital in Ghana. Uh, we, we want um, to have this as a place that African surgeons can train. They're not going to be limited. It's not going to be limited to people from Ghana, but from every part of the continent. They get the skills that they need and they go back to their countries and then build on those skills. To me, it is the most effective way to really bring and transfer expertise yes. from here to there. Um, and that's, that's what the foundation is about. Our next gala would be in October or November, somewhere in, in the Washington DC. So we invite everybody to join us. And they can keep up with uh, news about the foundation and your work on the website correct and www.foundationforspecialsurgery.org yeah. and we actually just put out our summer uh, newsletter which is available online fantastic dr yes. Mohini, your story always so fascinating you are always so inspiring and thank you for being our vip of the day thank, thank you, you so th much. thank you for inviting us